Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. I'm excited to have Sarah Foster joining us. Um, thanks, Sarah. Welcome, thanks for having me. So um, Sarah's the best-selling author of six psychological thrillers, um, so, sorry, psychological suspense novels, which I think we can see them all there in the background. <laughs> And they are You Don't Know Me, The Hidden Hours, All That Is Lost Between Us, Shallow Breath, Beneath the Shadows, and Come Back to Me. Her seventh novel, The Hush, is a near future thriller, was published by HarperCollins in Australia and Blackstone in the US in November 2021. Sarah lives in Western Australia with her husband and two young daughters and is a doctoral candidate at Curtin University. So just thanks so much for joining us. I just want to tell people why you are here. Um, so I recently listened to The Hush on audio and absolutely loved it and thought I need to get Sarah on here so we can chat to her about it. Um, it was five stars for me. So I contacted her and thankfully she said that she would join us. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I've heard that the um, audiobook narrators, I haven't listened to the whole book, but I've heard they do a fantastic job. So very lucky. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. So just wondering if you want to start off by telling us a bit about The Hush. Sure, I'd love to. Um, so The Hush is set in the near future in the UK. And it's at a time when there have been a number of unexplained stillbirths happening across the country. And in addition, um, pregnant teenage girls are going missing. So um, in response to this, the government has decided they're going to clamp down on people's freedoms and increase their powers of surveillance across the population. And into this backstory come my main characters of Emma and Lainey. They're a mother and daughter, and Emma is a midwife at the local hospital, and she's there trying to help the women who need her. Um, and Lainey is a student at the local high school, and her friend Ellis is one of the missing girls. So to begin with, this situation doesn't feel too close to them. They're dealing with it, but it doesn't feel like it's affected them personally. But as the story goes along, various things happen and they begin to realise that they are completely caught up in what's going on around them. And women's freedoms particularly are being eroded very quickly. Um, so they must turn to their formidable group of female friends and relatives in order to try and protect themselves and get themselves safe. So although it's kind of starts with this very dark, dramatic, dystopian feel, it's really a book about a celebration of women and how mm. women come together in really difficult circumstances, um, how they encourage each other on and the power of female friendship and community. Mm. So I'm really interested to know, what was the first idea you had for this book? Yeah, so the first thing that occurred to me was um, it was about mothers and daughters, really, was the central premise. So I wanted to write uh, a fiction where mothers were present in a, mm. a daughter-centric story, so or just they had equal roles. Um, I'd noticed that a lot of the dystopian fiction that came out in the kind of early 2000s, mid-2000s, that had these really empowered young female heroines didn't have mothers at all, or if they did, they were either emotionally absent, physically absent, you know, sick one thing or another mother was very oppressed in one way or another and i wanted to look at why that was and also to try and reconnect that matrilineal maternal line in the fiction see what happened when all of those generations were there and that's really what i started to build on i became so interested in that idea that i actually applied to do a phd in it as well and oh, look really? at why the mm. mothers had gone missing in this kind of fiction and what it mm says about you know society culture commentary that kind of thing and so it's been a fascinating process doing mm. the fiction and the study at the same time mm, yeah i bet and i'm interested to know also did you start writing or think of this before COVID? yes so i had the idea back in 2015 yeah um it's just crazy how the events of the world have mirrored mm. some of the themes in the book and i mm. have had to just as I went along so I had it before Donald Trump came to power I had it before oh, the Me Too yeah. movement I was writing it during those times mm -hmm. um and then I was kind of on the last leg of it when Covid started to creep the last leg of the first draft and Covid came into all our lives and I really did look at it and go 
oh my god you know I'm writing this book that's very dark Mm -hmm. and now we're in this very difficult dark time and and what's what is the purpose of it but it very quickly um became obvious to me that the the original core of it was the mother-daughter story and the power of women and I thought well actually it's even more relevant now because we need those stories where we go actually we're looking directly at the darkness here but here's a way through and here's a way that they managed to uplift Mm. one another and actually figure out ways to fight back so Mm. that really pushed me on with the book yeah yeah and um how far in the future do you think your book is well it was five to ten years was in my mind you know I didn't want to pin it too closely so I always sort of give a little bit of a parameter there because I don't want to pin it anywhere I want it to be able to float a little bit um so that people can still read it and apply it kind of as an allegory to various things that are going on around Mm -hmm. us um but yeah I felt that it was quite close but in actual fact it's become a hell of a lot closer in feeling for Mm -hmm. everybody than it was when I began it so I did begin it thinking it was a futuristic slightly futuristic work of fiction Mm -hmm. um and I didn't expect the themes to become as topical as quickly but having said that I was writing with themes in my mind like this slow erosion of women's rights and the kind of pushback against women's independence and what might happen in a society if um, problems happened around maternal issues and so all of those things were very much in my mind I just didn't expect them to come on so fast yeah yeah and what sort of feedback have you got from readers um yeah interesting actually Uh, it seems to be extremely well received when people pick it up Mm. but I have noticed there's a little bit of uncertainty about whether to pick it up I was talking to my publisher earlier on today and she was like we need to tell people that you know if you get past the beginning it's about you know it's a hopeful story there's a lot in there to celebrate and feel good about because Mm. in this particular time I think it is a lot to ask people to pick up a story like this yeah um when people are looking for escapism I'm looking for escapism and um so yeah it's been published at a very interesting time but I'm hoping that through word of mouth it will find its readership and people will keep talking about it and sharing it once they know what it's about and they can see the story in there that yeah it will get shared yeah and I know lots of people in our group have said how much they've loved it when they have read it so hopefully we're helping you spread the word in our group well thank you very much for that I appreciate that word of mouth is the best gift you can give any author so that's wonderful and we've got quite a few people watching um a lot of yeah I've got someone Kelly says she's a huge fan Sarah says she loved the hush and read it over two days um Sarah also said that she found some of the things very close as parents are having to de- make decisions about vaccinating their children. Mm. So, yeah, lots of good um, words here from people. Just, Absolutely. Just wanting to say as well, if anyone's watching and does have a question for Sarah, please type it and I'll read it out. Um, Kelly also said was very, very realistic premise at the moment. Have you been surprised how favourably it's been received? Um, well, I was definitely nervous about it. I, I did feel like it's, you know, up, right up there with the best things that I've written because there was so much mm. depth in it and that was done over quite a few years and a lot of work. So I hoped that people would feel that, you know, mm. kind of the way it was constructed. Um, But I was definitely nervous about how it would be received at this time. And I have been very overwhelmed about the feedback is really good. You know, like people saying such great things and really resonating with them, which is what you want to do when you write. You want to connect with people Mm -hmm. about things and talk to people about these different issues and and be okay to go in the grey areas, particularly when we're so used to having all this kind of soundbite stuff thrown at us where you have to think one way, you have to think this way. And I hope that fiction is still doing that this kind of social exploration in fiction where we get to actually discuss things together Mm. and um and see the knotty gray issues but we also feel I'm sure as this kind of women empowered story that there are threads through where we can all come together as well you know and feel like yes we want to Mm -hmm. kind of rally and fight back against this kind of oppression and that kind you know and that's not on the table for Mm. that's gone too far you know that's Mm. not on the table for discussion Mm. but some of the other areas um yeah I think definitely it's it's an interesting mix and I'm always happy to talk about all those issues with everybody because 
yeah, I think there are a hell of a lot of issues in there that we need to talk about. Yeah, yeah. And I I haven't read any of your other books before The Hush was your first one. I'm wondering how different that is from your others. Well, so I like to write psychological suspense fiction. Yeah. Um, some of them are more mystery, some of them are more thriller. Um, they've all got a kind of a theme in it, which is normally contemporary issues. So mm -hmm. All That's Lost Between Us was looking at what happens when your teenagers get on social media and there's a whole kind of mystery built around a teenage girl who is hiding stuff from her parents and yeah and then shallow breath is all about um kind of environmental issues and people that work with different types of animals and but set again around a, a thriller mm. background to mm. that um so i'm just interested in asking questions that fascinate me really and bringing them up in the fiction and including them in the world building um so that you get both hopefully <laughs> a really fast paced fun exciting read but you also get that kind of thoughtful exploration in the background yeah and as the hush though the only one set in the future yeah it yeah. is yeah all the others are contemporary yeah yeah so kelly said that um she's read a few of your books but the hush is definitely her favorite and she's wondering if you will write more um similar to the hush in that genre uh yes i would like to definitely stay around those i mean i've got a contemporary fiction idea that's another complex mother-daughter mystery story mm. um and then but i do also have threads of the continuation of the hush mm, um, okay. and i'm just outlining it at the moment because yeah. it's very difficult to pinpoint where to go next sometimes when you're under contract and people are asking for different things mm. um i've just written a novella as well that's going to be out on audible um and so that's more psychological suspense so i want to kind of stay within the different arenas of the suspense mystery thriller mm. um but then this very female focused storytelling and then hope yeah add a little bit of this future not too dis i'm not I, I can't do the real proper science fiction stuff but this very close future yeah story, yeah. Very interesting. yeah and are you a big uh, margaret atwood fan yeah i do love some of her stuff i mean a handmaid's tale when i was a teenager yeah. was the, probably one of the defining books of my teenage years mm. definitely and it's been very interesting to revisit it as i've grown up and to kind of get another take on it mm. over and over again and the studies have meant that i've gone back to it as well and mm. had a bit more of an in-depth look um and i know that one of the things that atwood said when she was constructing that world was that she didn't use anything that wasn't happening in the oh, world to yeah. construct her story mm. um and I, that always resonated with me when I was writing The Hush as well. And I was very conscious of the fact that I wasn't using anything that um, that wasn't really happening uh, mm. somewhere in the world. And I think hopefully that adds that sense of sort of kind of power and urgency and, you know, that gripping read that you are aware that it's digging into aspects of real life as well. Yeah, yeah. And Sarah wonders if you've had any offers of um, your book being adapted to TV or movie. Oh, yeah. So it's gone back and forth, actually. There's mm. definitely been interest. It's been out there and there's been talk. And mm. um, so you try not to TV and movies are such a long process. Normally, every now and again, one goes fast. But you try not to pay too much attention you get a little bit excited <laughs> mm. but then let it all quiet down until um it really happens my agent is very much of the um idea that something will happen in that area so we'll have to see um, yeah. and she's you know, dealing with various people who are interested at the moment yeah i could imagine it being great for tv mm. yeah i would mm. love to see it too yeah and Kelly wonders about the cover i'm just wondering if you want to hold up the cover oh, yeah, to... yeah, yeah. another one here look there we go. Um, whether you had any input. She loves the <laughs> um, Babushka good dolls on it. Ah, uh, yes. So, yes, I did. So it was an interesting story, actually, because um, we had a couple of different cover looks for this one. And mm. one was very much more of a thriller suspense. Um, it was just broken dolls on a black background. Oh, and okay. it was very kind of, it was quite catchy in a thriller way. It was a mm. nice, really nice cover. And it looked much more like my other books. Um, but this one just felt like the power of those dolls interlocking and the kind of the really bold out there femininity mm. of that cover. Mm. Um, yeah, it just felt like it was exactly the right fit. We felt it was a bit bold, a bit dangerous, a bit 
um yeah but it certainly sticks out on the shelf as well so yeah exactly <laughs> yeah yeah and i'm wondering if you could tell us about um your story of how you first got published and how hard or easy that was for you sure so um i've got quite an interesting background because i worked in publishing ever since i was 23 um, and I worked in HarperCollins in the UK as an editorial assistant. Well, actually, I was an editorial secretary, first of all, and my job was um, assistant to the publishing director for fiction. So I kind of earned my stripes watching what everyone else did around me mm. and slowly came up to editorial assistant. And then I moved to Australia and brought all my editorial work with me and started working for companies here. Um, so I had quite a lot of background and insight into, first of all, how you put a book together, and secondly, who was where in the industry and, and what was going on in the industry. And so when I got my agent for Come Back to Me, which was my first book, I um, and we decided that we were going to send it out under a pseudonym. And so we sent it to all the publishers under a different name because they were used to me working as an editor. Oh, okay, um, yeah. And I was very lucky and got a number of offers for that book and got to fly over to Sydney and um, talk to the people and decide who I was going to work with. But I have to say that, um even with all that insight but when i first gave it to my agent she spent a good year helping me work it up to the level that it needed to be mm -hmm. um because so different you know writing and editing you really have to put different hats on at times so there was a lot of work went into reaching that process that pro that point sorry um but once we had uh i had a bit of a dream run to start with really mm -hmm. and if you could be a character from the hush for a day <laughs> who would you choose to be and why oh that's a great question um well i think i'd have to be geraldine really yeah. <laughs> just to see what it's like to live in her shoes so geraldine's kind of the matriarch of the family but a very unusual matriarch mm. because she actually left home and left her own daughter emma to be raised by her mother so that geraldine could go off and have this very academic um feminist career and she's written lots of books and she's very well known and one thing or another but she wears her thoughts on her sleeve yeah. and says it how it is she's quite eccentric but she's also got this very kind side to her and this kind of really key insight and dry humor as well about certain mm. moments that would seem quite bleak without her there to counter them so it would be very nice to be in her shoes a bit more and just to see <laughs> where yeah. she went and what she did <laughs> So I'm wondering, did you have some strong women um, influences in your life growing up? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, my I grew up with a single mum for the first 12 years of my life. Um, mm. And so she was very, obviously very strong influence, just me and her. Um, and she was a mad, passionate reader as well. So her shells were lined and I could take my pick. Mm. And really, that's how I was introduced to books at such an early age. Um, and I also found it quite inspiring as well that it, although she was single mum, my mum worked and was kind of had this career as a lecturer and, and at a university and one thing or another. And I was always very proud of how she juggled all the different roles that she needed to do. So, um, yeah, very much looked up to her yeah. and plenty of other brilliant women in my family as well. Very lucky. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Sarah's got a good question. She said, your characters had very interesting stories. Where did you get inspiration for them? Yeah, well, it's quite eclectic, really. I just build them from pieces, pieces that come as I go along. So I'll mm. start with just a snippet of an idea. Um, you know, for example, discovering that Emma was a midwife and mm. that was going to be core to the story because that would allow her access into the hospital and these very crucial intimate moments that women were having you know we would be able to be on hand for those um and then you just start to ask yourself more and more questions about why she's doing this or what would she do that and one thing or another and i find that i take a long time with that process so i don't write anything down for about a year when i start getting mm. characters in my mind and I just literally think about them a lot, let them talk to me. And I feel like that way I can tell whether they're going to come to life because it's quite hard to do that in a way. Yeah. And if the characters fade, um, you know that there's not enough about them to carry them into the story. Mm -hmm. But if they start really speaking to you, then you can really then start pushing into what the story and the plot lines are going to be one thing or another. Mm -hmm. um, I had a funny story about that. I had Geraldine 
um, who had just been talking about the matriarch in my head for a long time, and I wanted her to be a first person voice in the story, and I couldn't get it in without interrupting the mother daughter dynamic, so oh, I gave that up. Yeah. But it meant that by the time I got to writing her, she'd been in my head for a long, long time. And I just wrote like 20 pages of her just getting it out, you know, <laughs> just kind of manifesto of Geraldine. Yeah. So I was thinking none of this is going to get in the book, but we really need to just get all this out. Yeah. <laughs> so they really do come to life for me after a while. Mm. And um, yeah. Mm. And can you tell us, are you working on something new at the moment? Yes, yeah, so I'm a little bit in between everything. So I've just finished the edits for The Deceit and um, the Audible book. And mm. then I am just finishing my exegesis part of my PhD as well. So that's pretty challenging. Um, and so then I've got these two or three ideas that I'm playing around with and outlining in the meantime. And come, uh, you know, another eight weeks or so, and I'll be able to pick one of those up and run with it. So I'm really yeah. seeing which one actually starts to develop a bit more. Mm. I'll try that one first. Mm. And I'm interested to know what sort of research you did for the hash. Yeah, well, it was a real mix. So there was a lot of topical research, so news items, you mm. know, like various things that were going on. There was um, quite a bit of future thinking research. So I'd look at future thinkers, um, academics, one thing or another, who predicted where we were going to be in five to ten years. Um, and that's where things like the you know little robots coming in at one stage or another that are doing a little so it's that that sounds very science fiction but it's just kind of uh i think they're they're working as ticket inspectors at the train station and they just look a bit more human it's mm. almost like a kind of yeah they've moved on from kind of holograms and they've tried to make these sort of automatic ticket inspectors look more human and just those kind of developments were forecasted i don't know whether they will actually um, come to pass in that way but a lot of the things in the book like that were forecasted yeah um funnily enough emma takes um tests every morning and you know like they go automatically to the hospital telling her that she's well enough to work and mm, kind of which we I all, put that yeah. in just because it felt right but mm. in actual fact that's very much looking like it's going to be something that might actually come to pass mm. um and then i did a lot of the academic research on feminism motherhood gender studies all that kind of thing so all of that played into different aspects of the novel as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is there anything when you were doing your research like that really, really surprised you? Um, I think it surprised me that in some ways we are not further along in kind of feminist gain. Mm -hmm. So we feel like we've gained a lot and we have gained a lot in certain ways, but it feels like all the women I know who are my age in particular are doing this massive juggle of motherhood and yeah. work and whatever that you know mm. and and life is just incessant and everyone's exhausted and it feels like women still shoulder a lot of the load of the emotional support for everybody you know mm. kind of that caring support but now it's expected to be combined with having a career but there's been no actual structural changes to society to support that so mm. you know we're still everyone still has to work nine to five and the daycare centers only operate nine to five and that yeah. kind of thing and they don't allow for women to have these problems so you get these women who are kind of embarrassed or ashamed about ringing in when their kids are sick because they mm. can't get to work whereas in actual fact if mm. work changed mm. and the hours became flexible there's no problem the yeah. women would work mm. <laughs> women are so great at adapting but it, it's all put back on the individual woman as you're not this you're not that you know and then mm. put your instagram face on and get your, you know and all that mm. kind of thing and i feel like the burden has shifted but you know whether that's progress i would really question and i think it's just so important that we all talk about that yeah. and keep that conversation going. Yeah, no, that's really interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. And what about reading yourself? Are you a big reader and what do you like to read? Like I am a really big reader and an eclectic reader as well. So, mm -hmm. And I must admit that what's happened of late is that I've got so much of a glutton with wanting to read everything and wanting to listen to audiobooks and one thing or another that I almost lost my concentration you know and I'd, I'd read the first two ch chapters of this and then I'd listen to that and then I so I've really tried to pin myself down now I've got one audio book and one <laughs> fiction book on the go mm. and yeah just finish those and don't dot about with different things um my genres uh, my fallback genres would definitely be psychological suspense and kind of the 
female centric fiction so people like lisa jewell jody people maggie o'farrell i love as well um yeah just but i'm interested in everything really <laughs> and is there anything you might have read lately that you would like to recommend to us ah um yes actually well look i've got um this one has just come out when we fall by Ethan clifford that's a brilliant crime novel mm. um so yeah def definitely recommend that um and then there's another book that's just come out by monique mulligan called wildflower as well oh it's a beautiful story so well told um, we recently about had monique subject. join us she yeah sorry R monique recently joined us which was great. Oh, yeah yeah lovely yeah so i'd very much recommend that as well um there's a couple more actually i've got on here there's um sasha wesley um this one's coming out soon um that's a beautiful story as well kind of a, a road trip where self-discovery and then another fantastic crime novel that's the proof of it um ray cairns the good mother um, oh yes so, i've read yeah, i so, listened to the audio of that one as well that was a good oh, one yeah yeah it's brilliant isn't yeah. it yeah yeah lots of great reads to come <laughs> yeah there are well thanks and don't those. forget don't forget as well i'm interviewing dervla mctiernan as well and um she's got oh, a new one that will be good. And yeah. i know everyone is excited about that yeah. so um, yeah that's called the murder rule so happy for that as well yeah. yeah have you read that one yet or you still have to read it well i read it quite a while ago in proof form so mm. yeah i'm really looking forward to in an early draft form actually rather than proof form. so i'm really looking forward to reading it again and seeing mm. the final version mm. and for you what would you say being a successful writer means oh do you know what um it means just knuckling down and riding the roller coaster mm. of writing. There are some lovely times where you get recognition for something that you've written, um, and that's amazing. But a lot of the time, it's uh, it's hard work, and it's yeah. just reminding yourself that you love this profession and that you just want to keep telling stories. And it's doing the work when no one's watching. I think that's what makes you more successful than the bits everyone sees. Mm. It's that you're prepared to go into that room day after day and just work on that story when there is no one there. Mm. And what do you hope readers love about your books? Yeah, well, I would like readers to feel like they have been entertained. I would like readers to feel like they've kind of been on a bit of a ride and a bit of a journey with these characters. And I would like them to feel like there is some depth to the story that they can that leaves them thinking about the issues and the people involved and that so that they resonate with them mm. and yeah, stay with them for a little mm. bit. Mm. And do you have a favorite place to write? <laughs> uh, really with my family circumstances is anywhere quiet, you know, <laughs> yeah. kids and pets and all these kinds <laughs> of things. Um, so I do quite like to go and work at the local cafe, actually. It overlooks the, the little lake and it's it's quite nice and peaceful early in the morning. So that's a nice one. Mm. But yeah, I take, I take my, I, you know, if I get a good spot wherever. to write and I have a few hours, I'll go wherever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And have you got any advice you'd like to give to a new writer? Uh, yes, there will be plenty of advice. Um, but I think to keep it simple, one of the things that I really love um, saying to writers that might feel overwhelmed because there's such a lot of advice out there um, is that basically just to find a story that you love or an author that you admire and to use that as your kind of touchstone book and to just read that book and just analyze it and figure out mm -hmm. how they do what they do mm -hmm. and take that book apart and just use one. You know, you don't need a whole genre, you don't need to read. 30 books on craft those craft books are awesome but don't feel like you have to overwhelm yourself with information uh probably sometimes it's better to see what speaks to you in terms of the fiction mm -hmm. um and then just find a person who's already doing that and look at what makes them such a master mm -hmm. and yeah that's what i do when i get stuck as well i go back to someone who i think does something really well and i go how did they manage to yeah. make me feel like that I'll get that atmosphere in and um yeah i just think that is helpful Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much for chatting with me. Been great to talk to you. Just wondering if you want to tell people how they can keep in touch with you. Yes, absolutely. So my um, website is sarahfoster.com.au and I have a newsletter sign up on there as well, uh, which comes out every couple of months or so and is, tells you all my information first and what's happening with me. 
um, and I have social media sites. I'm on Facebook um, at Sarah Foster Author, and I'm on Instagram at Sarah Foster Author. Um, sometimes on Twitter, but not so much. So mm. they're really the prime places you'll find me. Mm. And one last question before we go from Sarah. She said, are there any um, specific rules for good writing? <laughs> uh, number one, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, number two, I would say less is more. So always think about how you can pair stuff back. Mm -hmm. um, yeah and yeah those are probably my top two i'm trying to think of a third that it's eluding me right now but yeah um just set yourself a goal every day and just try and meet and make it manageable mm. because even if you do 500 words a day that is going to build up to something quite substantial quite quickly mm. um and don't be afraid to step back and look critically at your work either as you go along um, don't worry about that mm. and don't show it to too many people too soon and I'll <laughs> stop now before <laughs> I get carried away <laughs> no thanks so much and thanks to everyone who joined in and asked questions yeah thanks very much everyone lovely to talk to you thanks, thanks. bye everybody bye